In 1925, in San Francisco, California, a group of Freemasons, really, founded a new political party to promote democracy and federalism. That party still exists today and is part of the ruling regime in China. Seriously, the People's Republic of China. Hi, I'm Fredo Rockwell, and welcome to another edition of Strange Politics. And I kid you not, the China Zhigong Party, also known as the China Public Interest Party, or Zhongguo Zhigong Dang, really was founded in 1920s California by Freemasons, and really is part of a coalition of parties that currently governs the People's Republic of China. You're probably wondering how this can possibly be true everyone knows that China is a one-party dictatorship led by Xi Jinping's Communist Party. How can there be other parties helping to rule China? Well, yes, the People's Republic of China is totally a one-party dictatorship in practice. Officially, however, there are eight other legal political parties represented in China's rubber stamp parliament, the National People's Congress, which officially at least run the country together. And one of these is the China Zhigong Party. Having a gaggle of small deferential parties that pretend to take part in a democratic system is a feature in a surprising number of dictatorships, especially communist dictatorships. I've covered parties of this sort twice before, in North Korea and East Germany. And although it seems to defy common sense, these regimes go to great lengths to pretend to be plural democracies, even though most people don't even notice this charade let alone believe it. Most of the eight legal non-communist parties predate the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. They were co-opted by the communists, who then strong-armed them into subservient roles, where they remain today. Among these is the China Zhigong Party, which, as previously mentioned, was founded in San Francisco by Freemasons. Who are the Freemasons? The usual answer to that question is that the Freemasons are a worldwide secret society which first went public in London in 1717, and which, ever since, conspiracy theorists have accused of trying to take over the world. That's not the answer I'm going to give today, though, because the Freemasons that met in San Francisco were not those Freemasons. These were members of a different secret society, which has had many names over the years, but was originally known as the Tian Di Hui, or Heaven and Earth Society. There are a lot of contradictory sources out there, but the best source I could find says it was founded in 1761 in Fujian province. Like the British Freemasons, members of the Tian Di Hui swear to support and protect fellow members, and use a series of secret signs and passwords to recognize each other. The Tian Di Hui was originally a club for the relatively poor from the lower middle classes, but its lodges grew in size and number and it began spreading to different parts of China, and alongside Chinese immigration, the rest of the world. As they expanded, these lodges adapted to local conditions, taking on different forms and sometimes different purposes. For example, in Hong Kong, Tian Di Hui members are more commonly called Hongmen and are currently banned because Hong Kong's organized crime groups, known as the Triads, are believed to have originated in local Tian Di Hui societies. Lodges began appearing in the United States and Canada in the 1800s, and over time began to mimic American fraternal organizations like the Oddfellows, the Elks, and of course, the Freemasons. And though they called themselves Zhigong Tong in Chinese, in English they became known as Chinese Freemasons. Many of these lodges still exist today. If you see a troupe of authentic dragon dancers in the U.S., there's a decent chance that group is part of a Chinese Freemasonry lodge. Just to be clear, the Chinese Freemasons have no connection to the Freemasonry which originated in England, other than a superficial resemblance. But in the 1800s and early 1900s, both groups attracted members with progressive political ideas. And if you are someone interested in starting a revolution based on those ideas, these groups could be an extremely valuable resource. For example, in 1844, Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi was initiated as a Freemason while in exile in Uruguay. He wasn't really interested in Masonic ritual or mysticism, 
But Garibaldi did value the network of like-minded people that he could draw support from in Europe and the United States. With what was possibly the exact same motive, the Chinese nationalist revolutionary Sun Yat-sen, while also in exile, joined a Chinese Freemasonry lodge in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1904. Sun later formed his own secret society, the Tong Meng Hui, which then gave birth to the Kuomintang. That name might sound familiar. The Kuomintang, or KMT, was for many decades the ruling party of the Republic of China. One of the problems with revolutions is they tend to produce messy results. And the results of China's 1911 revolution were very messy indeed, and a long civil war ensued. Sun Yat-sen gained control over part of China, but spent the next decade trying to establish control over the rest. Then, in 1922, one of his chief Kuomintang lieutenants, Chen Jiangming, launched a revolt against Sun in Guangdong province. Chen objected to the overly centralized, undemocratic structure that Sun and the Kuomintang were enforcing. But Chen's revolt went badly, and he was forced to flee to Hong Kong in 1925. And then, just a few months later, Sun Yat-sen died from cancer, without having established a clear successor. And so the stage is set for our meeting of Chinese Freemasons in San Francisco that October. As you now know, America's Chinese Freemasonry lodges have been playing a part in Chinese revolutionary politics for decades. After all, they did arguably help launch the Kuomintang. Meanwhile, the Republic of China was in a mess. Its most famous leader was dead, and there was a real need for someone to come in and clean things up. Why not Chen Jiangming? He's not famous today, but Chen enjoyed a lot of support at the time, especially in his home region of Guangdong Province. Guangdong Province was the part of China that most of San Francisco's Chinese immigrants were from. So for the Chinese Freemasons of San Francisco, Chen Jiangming was probably a local hero. Originally a schoolteacher, Chen became active in local politics in the final years of the Qing Dynasty and was famous for his efforts to outlaw vices, especially opium smoking and gambling. He had also served as a military general and led a coup in Guangdong for one of the earliest phases of the revolution, and he was one of Sun Yat-sen's most important early supporters. Unlike Sun and the Kuomintang, however, Chen wanted China to have a federal structure overseen by a multi-party democracy. So, yeah, it's easy to see how Chen Jiangming would be popular with American Chinese Freemasons originally from Guangdong, and why in October 1925, those Freemasons would establish the Zhigong Party and elect Chen as its general secretary. There's very little information available online about the early days of the Zhigong Party, at least that I could find. I'm not sure Chen himself was actually at this meeting in San Francisco. I couldn't find any sources that say he was there, or even that he himself was a Chinese Freemason, although it seems very likely to me that he was. One thing we do know is that the Zhigong Party adopted this cool flag, which for obvious reasons is referred to as the tic-tac-toe flag. But its design is not meant to commemorate the annoying children's game, no. This symbol refers to the well-field system of Chinese agriculture. Bear with me. Eight private farms are placed around the edges of a community-owned farm. Everyone grows their own food on their farm, and then, in their spare time, helps grow food on the community farm. The community-owned food is then sent to the emperor as a way of paying taxes. If the system ever actually existed in reality, and many scholars doubt that it did, it was during what's known as the Spring and Autumn Period, between 770 and 403 BC, a long, long time ago. So with this flag, the Zhigong Party wasn't promoting an agricultural policy. No, it was hearkening back to a possibly mythical golden age of Chinese society, when things were properly organized and everyone was peaceful and happy. It's also a cool flag. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you that the Chinese Freemasonry Lodge in San Francisco where all this went down is still there today, on Spofford Lane in Chinatown. It's visible on Google Maps, and on the top of the building you can see where it says Chinese Freemasons, sort of. And on the door you can see the name of the lodge, Ji Gong Tong, the Chinese name for Chinese Freemasons. Tong means hall or lodge, but more interestingly, the way the Chinese characters on the doorway would be transliterated into English today is Zhi Gong. So in other words, Zhi Gong Party could also be said to mean Chinese Freemasonry Party. 
After its founding in California, the Zhigong Party quickly moved its base of operations to Hong Kong, which, after all, is where Chen was in exile. But, as you will probably have guessed, the party failed to successfully take control of the Republic of China as had been hoped. No, the power vacuum in China and the Kuomintang was filled by General Chiang Kai-shek. This left Chen and the Zhigong Party to mostly just issue criticisms at a distance. Then, in 1933, Chen sadly died from typhus. It's really hard not to see Chen Jiangming as a tragic figure. I've only covered a very small part of his life. He worked tirelessly to improve the lives of the people of Guangdong with substantial success in many ways, but he's been largely sidelined from Chinese history today. A year after his death, Chen's supporters launched a fundraising campaign and built a tomb for his remains in Huizhou City, which is still there. So he's not totally forgotten. During World War II, the Zhigong Party, still based in Hong Kong, was nearly wiped out during the Japanese occupation. The remnant of the party that survived soon began to cozy up to the Communist Party of Mao Zedong, which, after the war, successfully drove Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang out of mainland China into exile in Taiwan. In 1949, the China Zhigong Party officially joined the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the official united front which, on paper at least, has ruled the People's Republic of China since its founding later that same year. The China Zhigong Party has been totally subordinate to the interests of the Chinese Communist Party ever since. I mentioned before that there were eight of these minor parties the communists keep around like pets. You might wonder why China bothers, since hardly anyone has ever heard of any of them. It's a good question. Besides creating a pretense of multi-party democracy, one possible use is that these parties soak up talented and ambitious non-communists and wall off its members in a political cul-de-sac where they're unlikely to cause any real trouble. With this in mind, perhaps, each party has been assigned a constituency to cater to. For example, the China Democratic League is made up mostly of teachers, professors, and intellectuals. The Zhuishan Society is the party for scientists. There's even a fake Kuomintang party, which descendants of former Kuomintang officials are encouraged to join. So how about the China Zhigong Party? Considering how and by whom it was founded, it will not surprise you to learn that the China Zhigong Party is primarily focused on engaging with the overseas Chinese community. It is also used to engage with the modern-day lodges of the Tian De Hui, the Chinese Freemasons. The bigger question, to me at least, is why does anyone bother to join the China Zhigong Party? Its websites are full of notices of official conferences and statements about this or that, and it all seems like a colossal waste of time. Well, sometimes wasting time is fun, right? I mean, you're watching a YouTube video about an inconsequential political party. Joining the China Zhigong Party is not a way to access the top echelons of power in China, but not everyone is that ambitious. The party is obviously well-funded, and membership probably provides useful connections, both inside and outside China. And there are all those party conferences to go to. Also, bonus, some members of the China Zhigong Party do actually achieve moderate positions of power. The current leader of the party previously served as Vice Minister of Health between 2004 and 2007. Oh, and wait, there's another Zhigong Party. In 2000, a party now called the Chinese National Zhigong Party was founded in Taiwan, also reportedly by Chinese Freemasons. The party calls for the unification of Taiwan and China and became known for its willingness to engage with mainland Chinese politicians. It managed to get a few local councillors elected here and there, but not much more. And I thought the party had become inactive around 2019 until just a few weeks ago, the party's vice chairman was arrested on charges of taking money from and interfering in elections for the People's Republic of China. So it appears that Taiwan's Zhigong Party still exists, but is not doing so well at the moment. What does this all mean? Well, not much. Neither of the current Zhigong parties are actually that important, but they are interesting. Should we be worried that Chinese Freemasons are trying to take over the world? I don't think so. I mean, let's be honest, there's not much of a track record of success to point to here. Should we be worried about the other Freemasons or other secret societies taking over the world? Mmm, no. From time to time, secret societies do play a role in politics, 
usually just to provide a network for fundraising or organizing activities. And usually the involvement of the secret society is just peripheral and fades over time. I could tell you about some other examples, but for that, my friend, you'll need to subscribe. See you in the next video.